How are we doing, River Point Church? You guys good? Here at Missouri City. Man, you guys are way better looking than they told me. I love it. This is beautiful. Hey, help me out. Uh, let's welcome everyone at the Richmond campus and everyone at West End. And can we give the most gracious round of applause to all those amazing men at the Ramsey unit? We love you, all of you guys. Everybody watching online, we're happy you're with us online. Get to church with us next week. What do you say? Come on, let's go. Hey, uh, I'm new here uh, to the Missouri City campus. My name is uh, Chad. My wife, Rachel, is with me this weekend. She's sitting somewhere amongst you guys. Um, and I just want to say what an absolute honor and a privilege it is uh, to get to be with you guys. I'm going to do this right off the bat. Uh, I just want to pray for this message because this one, they're all important to me, but this one is personal and it's near and it is dear to my heart. So let's at every campus, let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Your word says, let everything that has breath praise you. And God, we're all breathing here today. So we thank you, Father God, for another day, another opportunity to serve you um, and to experience life. Jesus, I pray that in these next few minutes that you would be lifted up that you would be the anthem, you would be the theme, you would be the center of everything that we do. Jesus, as we see such a, a sweet moment between you and one of your disciples today in the scriptures, I just pray that, God, you would awaken us to hear what you want to say. Give us our uh, a holy imagination to put ourselves inside this story and to grow and to be challenged. We give this time to you and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So just like you guys at your campuses had a daddy-daughter dance, uh, this last weekend, which I love. Uh, it, when I lived in Denver, Colorado for 17 years before we moved uh, to Texas, uh, every, every year at our elementary school, we had a daddy-daughter dance. Now, I have three uh, boys. I'm a boy dad, but I have one girl. She's 15 years old. And some of my best memories that I have with her were all of those years in elementary school when I got to go with her to the daddy-daughter dance. And we did it upright. Me and her, some of the dads and some of their friends, we would all get together and rent one of those obnoxiously big limousines. And we'd take them out like to, they thought, you know, Cheesecake Factory, super fancy, they thought. And it was just a, a blast. And uh, to counterbalance those, the daddy-daughter nights, they also at our elementary school had a mother-son sports night. And my wife uh, had extra work because she has three boys, and so she was busy every year doing that. Now, the problem with that, and I'm not telling you guys anything that uh, my wife didn't give me permission to tell you, um, and I'm going to put this nicely because she's in the house today. Um, for all of my wife's long list of skill sets, on that probably wouldn't be athleticism. Um, and again, babe, I love you. Uh, best friend in the world, but, but that's not at the top of the list for her is athleticism. So when she would go to these mother-son um, sports nights, it was kind of a vulnerable thing for her because she wanted to impress the boys and she wanted to get in there, but she also knew that sports wasn't her favorite thing. And they had this last year that she went with our uh, youngest boy. The last year they had these inflatables, and one of the inflatables, it was called the gauntlet. And from what I was told by some of my wife's besties, there was only like three or four moms out of the hundreds of moms that were there that night that dared to get in to the gauntlet and give it a try. And I'm not sure what kind of spirit came over my wife or what was going on, <laughs> but apparently she was one of the four moms that got in there and tried it, which just made me love her even more. But you want to know what I love most about the fact that she did that is one of her besties pulled out her iPhone and she filmed it. Watch this. I love you for trying. <laughs> That's awesome. I have to take my wife on a date night tonight for showing that. So thank you, uh, River Point Church, for helping enrich our marriage. And babe, thank you for being kind enough uh, to let me do that. If you're the note-taking type at any one of our campuses, I've titled today's message, I love you for trying. 
Now, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to see a really neat moment between Jesus and some of uh, the disciples. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. It's going to come up on the TV and the screens. And also, if you're new to River Point and maybe new to the whole church thing, we at every campus have Bibles, if you would like one, that we would love to give you out in the auditorium after the service is over. You can find someone with a lanyard, and they will give you uh, one of those. I do want to set the stage uh, before we get into Matthew chapter 14, though, and give this message uh, some context that it deserves. Uh, in 2021, uh, I was having, I would say, quite uh, possibly the darkest year of my life. So not too long ago, about th- three years ago. Uh, and the reason I'm okay talking about it is because we all have those years, right? It's a part of the cycle of life. There's some years that are incredibly blessed. There's some years that are incredibly kind of average. And then every now and then when our number's called, we're going to walk through what I call a dark night of the soul. You know, it's one of those years where uh, you're, you're putting your best foot forward, you're genuine, you're authentic, you're trying to walk in your faith, you're trying to do right by your friends, you're trying to do right by your family, but you know what I'm talking about? It's like you take a step forward and you're feeling good and then life hits you and it's like two steps backward. And it's one of those years where stuff like that just keeps perpetually happening. Well, that was me in 2021. And there was one Saturday night I was uh, preaching, getting ready to preach at a conference. And I'm in my hotel room and I'm doing my normal preacher stuff. I'm pacing back and forth and I'm praying to God to bless the message. And I'm going over my notes and I'm trying to get my heart where it needs to be to, to do ministry that night. And I was so distracted because I was just so over 20 21. Any of you guys ever been there in, in life before? In fact, I bet at all of our campuses, there's some, there's some people you'd say, that's actually kind of my 2024 so far. And if that's you, man, and I'm just, I just want to say whatever the reason is, I'm just, I'm sorry, but I, I know what that's like. I've been there. And so I'm sitting in my hotel room and I finally, I just couldn't keep concentrating on my work, what I was supposed to do. And I finally just started getting super real with God. And I was whining. I was complaining. At some point I was crying, pacing back and forth, just kind of going over how difficult of a year it was. And I, at some point in my hotel room, I think I told God that this was probably going to be my last sermon. And then I was done with ministry. Like that's how it had gotten in 20. 21 for me. And I remember at one point I just looked up to God and this is the heartbeat of this message today. I looked up to God and I wasn't shaking my fist at him, but with, with everything in me, I said, God, I'm trying. And that's as real as I've ever been with God. I meant every, I'm like, God, I am trying. And I just gave up and I just went and I laid down on my bed and I didn't have any more words. And I just laid there and I'm not a huge crier, but I sat there in that room and I was just bawling. I was just letting all of life in that moment come out. And I don't have a lot of mystical spiritual moments. If you do, uh, I've never heard an audible voice from God. If you have, talk to me after service and teach me your ways, right? Like I'd love to, actually, that'd be kind of terrifying. But the Bible does say this in John 10. It says that the, the sheep know the shepherd's voice, right? The longer you do this Jesus thing, the more you just start to understand when he's speaking to your soul and your mind and your spirit. And as I was laying on that bed, I will never forget it. Because there's this passage of scripture in the Old Testament. It's the book called the Song of Solomon. And it says this, God has brought us to his banqueting table. And it says his banner over us, church, is love. And I felt a blanketing of God, a kindness of God. I felt a tangible and palpable presence of God on a level that I don't think I have ever felt before. It was like when I said, God, I'm trying. It it did something to the heart of God to say, you know what? I'm going to be in that hotel room in a powerful way. I am going to blanket that poor son right now with my love. I'm going to bring him a peace he couldn't get on his own. I'm going to bring him a joy that bypasses the season of love life that he is in. And I just laid there and I felt not an audible voice, but deep in my heart, I could hear God say this to me. And here's why I'm giving this message this weekend and why it's personal. I could hear God say, son, I love you for trying. And my hope today at every single campus is that you would hear the heart of God saying the same thing to you in 2024, no matter what you walk in here with, No matter what you might be going through, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we serve a God who loves us for trying. But here's the rub, River Point Church. Here's the rub, West End, is this. We didn't grow up in a culture that cares much about trying. They don't make movies 
about trying. They make movies about utter successes and utter failures, right? And if we treated success, at least in the world's terms, success and failure, they would be on the opposite ends of the spectrum in life. We have our ideas of what success is. We have our ideas what failure is, right? But here's what I've I've learned is that most of life is not spent on the extreme sides of those spectrums. Most of our day-to-day life, most of what will happen in 2024 will be this grand experiment we call life. And you know what you're going to spend most of it doing? Just trying. Like, I think trying and the art of trying, and here, most importantly, the faith behind our try, the motive behind our try, is one of the most important things that we have to steward. Because successes are inevitable in life, and we know that failures are inevitable in life, but most of the time is going to be spent in the try. But again, we didn't grow up in a culture that celebrates that. We want to see how you did. Did you succeed? Or we want to see how you failed. We don't, the only thing we give any credit to for trying anymore apparently now is kids' sports, right? Like (laughs) everyone, if you try there, you get a medal. But other than that, we don't care. I thought that was funny, but apparently not. (laughs) Richmond liked it. Richmond likes me over there. No, I'm just kidding. There's a, and if you're, if you're in here and you're a, a Star Wars nerd, I'm going to trigger you for a minute. But I, I, there's a famous quote by the green sage Yoda. And he says this, and this explains our culture to a T. He says this, put this quote up, and I'll do my best to impersonate him. Do or do not. There is no try. That was, that was horrible. That was more Kermit the Frog than Yoda. <laughs> do not, no, don't clap for that any campus. Do not encourage that. That was horrible. But I kind of take issue you with that. No offense if you're, if you're in here and again, you're a Star Wars nerd. I have two sons that are Star Wars nerds. I am not a Star Wars nerd. I'll watch it with them. But other than that, I, here's why I'm not a Star Wars nerd. Uh, I chose to be married instead, right? Like <laughs> you get two options. It, it, you can go to the 12 o'clock showing on opening night of a new Star Wars movie dressed as Chewbacca, or you can have a girlfriend, but you don't get both. You don't get both. And I chose a girlfriend, and now I'm married to her, and it worked out. But, but it's like Yoda, like, do or do not, there is no try. But I, I just would lovingly say to the green little sage, like, no, I think it's a little less black and white. I think we serve a God, at least speaking for people who call themselves disciples, we serve a God who says, son, daughter, I love you for trying. But hear this, when you're trying is moved by faith. When the motive behind your trying is done out of an, 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 an honest motivation to love and to serve Jesus. I think that immediately makes it a success no matter how it turns out into the world. So Matthew chapter 14, uh, this is an awesome passage of scripture. Jesus just right before this fed uh, 15,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. The disciples all saw this incredible miracle. It was late at night. And Jesus says, hey, I'll catch up with you guys later, but we're going to do some ministry tomorrow on the other side of the shore. So get in your boat and I'll meet you over there. Here's where we pick up. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. In other words, there was what they called a tempest or what we would call there was a storm that night. Now, shortly before dawn, this is when it gets Star Warsy. Here we go. Jesus went out uh, to them walking. Do you hear that? Walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Don't get judgmental or self-righteous. You would have been terrified as well. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then I love this because Pete, right? Pete's a knucklehead. I love, he's one of my favorite people to preach about in all of the New Testament scriptures because I resonate with him on so many levels, mostly the bad parts though. But Pete, like him or not, he just goes first. And that's what a lot of leaders do is they just try first, and then people follow, right? He says, he says this, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water, to which I, I, I can hear his 11 best friends in the boat being like, are you serious, Pete? Did you just say that? Wait, I'm sorry, speaking to my good ear, did you just ask to defy the laws of science with Jesus walking on the water? And Pete's like, yeah, yeah, why not? Can I, can I come out? 
And this is where even if I'm Jesus, I'd have been like, Pete, bro, I, I love you, man. You got a great heart. I love, I love your motivation. I love your courage. But this is above your pay grade, man. This is for like me and the angels. Maybe someday on the other side of the grave in eternity, you'll be able to come out and do this. But, but the Star Wars stuff is just for, for me and the angels right now, not you. But, but what's, what's Jesus say? Come, he says, right? This was Pete like, can I try? Can I, can I come out there? But, but listen to me, that blesses the heart of God, River Point Church. You understand that? Think about this. Moms and dads, you know this. When your kids are little, anything they see you doing, no matter how young they are, no matter where they're at in life, what do they want to do? They want to do what you're doing. They don't think about the consequences. They don't think about if it's possible or not. They just know if my heroes in life, the ones who give me a roof over my head, the ones who feed me, the ones who take complete and beautiful care, the ones who love me unconditionally, if dad's doing it, I want to do it. If mom's trying it, can I try? And this is what Pete does with his heavenly father. Hey, can I try? And you think it would have just bothered or annoyed the heart of Jesus. But listen, put it, put it back up. Listen to what he says to Pete. His answer is, yeah, come on. Like, let's go. To which I imagine, I'm using my holy imagination here, but I imagine Pete going, oh, wait, what? He said yes? Oh, no. I just wanted to look tough and courageous in front of my friends. He wasn't supposed to say, of course, no human can, can walk on water, but Jesus said, and then you ever have one of those, like, 10-second conversations in your head when you're nervous, but it feels like 10-minute conversation, and it's super eloquent and thought through? This is where, in my mind, Pete would have quickly started going through the risk-reward, right? Because any act of courage or faith is always a risk reward proposition, right? It always comes with risk and it always comes with reward. I picture Pete, the minute he said that going, okay, risk, what if this doesn't work? That's a big risk, right? But then what if Pete's thinking reward? What if it does? Pete's thinking risk. I just wrote some down here. I think he would have been thinking, if it doesn't work, I am forever the butt of jokes to my 11 closest friends and the one I'm starting to call Lord and Savior. Reward, if it works, I gain newfound honor, respect, and influence with my 11 closest friends. I wrote risk. What if I disappoint Jesus? He didn't know. Maybe it would if he, if he got out and he, he failed real quick. But reward. What if I please the heart of Jesus for trying? And then I wrote biggest risk. And this one's just practical because there was a storm, right? What if I drowned? Like that's real, right? But then I wrote reward. What if today I'll always look back on as the day that I was most fully alive, simply because in the name of Jesus, I tried. Here's the deal, River Point Church, West End, listen to me. Faith is a risk reward proposition. It always is. It always will be. But here's the good news. Faith is never a blind proposition. You understand that? Faith will sometimes ask you, like Pete, to throw caution to the wind. It was dangerous to get out of that boat. And to think you could walk on water, but it was also dangerous because there was a, a huge storm. Like that's a, that's a big risk. Faith will ask you sometimes in 2024, some of you are walking through this right now. There's some big things on the horizon for you. There's some things that you, your family, your friends, you guys are considering right now, right? And it is risk and it is reward. It's got the potential for success. It's got the potential for failure. But here's the cool thing. Yes, faith will ask you sometimes to throw caution to the wind, but it will never ask you to throw wisdom to the wind in the process. Do you remember what Pete said? This is so important for you guys this year. What Pete said in the process was Jesus, if it's what? If it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water and I'll come. He didn't just say, can I come out on the water? He said, no, if you're in this, Jesus, if this is a God thing, if this is something that will please your heart, if this is something, Jesus, you want me to participate in, not just something I want to do or think would be neat, but if you are in this, then tell me to come out onto the water. And here's where we pick up. It says, Peter got down out of the boat. Walked on water. Can we not go past this too fast? He is, as far as we know, the only human, of course, besides Jesus, to ever do this in the history of the world simply because he had the heart of a child. And he said, hey, Jesus, can I try? He walks on water and he came towards Jesus. Now, if we stop there, huge success, right? That's huge success. That's one of the coolest things in the history of the world. He literally just broke the laws of physics and science with Jesus. But in the very, and tell me this isn't life sometimes. In the very next sentence, listen. But when he saw the wind, 
He was afraid, we've all been there, and beginning to sink, he cried out what? Lord, save me. So in just a matter of, I don't know, I'm just guessing, maybe let's say this took a total of one minute. In one minute, Pete had probably, arguably, one of the single greatest successes in any human's experience. And then in the last 30 seconds, what's he do? He starts to look at the wind. He starts to look at the surroundings. He starts to look at the waves and he gets his eyes off who? Jesus. Let's not miss the metaphor, right? Historically, this happened 2,000 years ago, but there is so much teaching and metaphor for us in there. Man, this is life. I've done this so many times where I just feel like I'm in a season where, man, my prayer life is good. I'm reading the Bible consistently. My spiritual disciplines are good. God's kind of cleaning up some of the darker or dirtier places of my heart, man. Things are are cooking with grease and going well. And then in a moment, some wind and waves of life can pick up like they will at times in 2024, just like in a year. And all of a sudden, you start to get your eyes off what got you walking on water in the first place, and you start to obsess with your surroundings. Can can I just ask us all to give ourselves some grace when that happens? Because we're going to see the grace that Jesus gives Pete. This wasn't about success, or this wasn't about failure. This was about faith, y'all. This was about the spirit of, hey, God, you've saved me. You've redeemed me. You've forgiven me. So I guess I'm playing this life now with house money. So can I try some things for your glory? Can I step out and make a difference this year? Can I step out in faith and do something awesome for your kingdom and for your glory? But then the wind and the waves get in the way. He takes his eyes like we've all done before. I've done it many times off of Jesus and he starts to sink. Right? This is just what I call real life, not success, not failure, just real life. Beginning to sink, though, and here's where we get the gospel. He cried out what? Lord, save me. Now, if I'm Jesus, and it's, it's a great thing that I'm not, here's what I would have done. I would have went into parent mode, and I would have started going, uh, thinking the way I think sometimes as a parent, which is like, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to save him. I'm going to honor that cry because I invited him out in the first place. But you know what? I'm going I'm to let him learn something here. So I'm going to let him drown for a little bit, you know, maybe... <laughs> 30, 40 seconds, I'm going to keep him under the water, you know, however big his lungs are, I'll decide. And then right about when, you know, I want to add a little trauma and PTSD to this experience. So next time he asks something so audacious of me and then has the audacity to get his eyes off of me and look at life and the chaos of it and gets afraid and starts to sing, I want him to remember that so it never happens again, right? But all that would have done is never got him out of the boat again. This, this should encourage you so much. This is the gospel. Anytime you throw out a, Lord, save me, listen to the heart of Jesus. What's it say? Immediately. That's the heart of Jesus. Oh, you tried for my glory? You put yourself out there this year for, for me? You, you put your faith on the line to live more full and to help serve and advance my kingdom in 2024? Well, then when you get your eyes off me, because life will at different times in 2024 get tough, you are a Lord save me away from me, immediately reached out my hand and I caught him. And then Jesus has a conversation with him. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And can I be honest with you? When I used to read the scriptures for the first time and growing up in church and in Sunday school, I would hear that. And in my heart, that would bother me about Jesus. And it was just because I didn't fully yet have a mature understanding of, of Jesus because I'm like, it sounds like you're mad at him, Jesus. Like this, this guy just did what nobody else probably in this room might even consider doing, breaking the laws of science with him. Jesus, if you're going to have a tough conversation of frustration, shouldn't it be with the 11 guys in the boat who just sat there and watched the whole time? with their dry robes and their pride intact, probably blogging 15 reasons Pete should have never got out of the boat, you know, on their high horse while they're vicariously watching him do something awesome. I I bet the minute, I bet they were shocked when he was walking on water, but I bet they were so relieved when he started sinking, right? Because here's the question, who took the biggest risk that day? I don't think it was Pete. I think it was the 11 guys who sat in the boat and watched. Let me speak to your ear this year. I think that'll be the biggest risk you'll take. I think that'll, that, that'll be the, the worst risk you take this year is just, just wanting to stay where you're at. Not having the courage to say, Jesus, where are you at? What are you up to? Where, where can I start walking on a little more water with you? Where can I partner with you? 
Jesus, this year, show me what's possible for us humans. Show me what's possible in my life. Get me past my fears. Get me past my reservation. God, this year, give me the grace and the faith and the courage to say, what boat do you want me stepping out of? And then just stepping out of it. So he said, hey, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, here's the deal. When you are a child of Jesus, can I just remind you who you are today? Sinking is no longer a failure. Do you know what it is? It's a classroom. Because you are not saved by works. You are not saved by walking on water. And you are not continually saved uh, or not saved by sinking in water. You are saved because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. That is who you are. So now when you say in life in any way, you step out of that boat and you try something for the glory and honor of Jesus and for the good of you and your family and you're succeeding, praise Jesus. But when you're failing, it is no longer an indictment on you like the world will put on you. It is a classroom. As we say in our house, you're either winning or you're learning. You're winning or you're learning. Because God does not love you predicated upon how well you're walking on water right now or if you're sinking. He just loves you because you bear his image and you have received him as Lord and Savior. So he just says, yeah. So he he disciples him after he saves him, then disciples him. He said, hey, let's talk about the doubt, though, because here's the deal, Peter. This is the last time I'm going to ask you and compel you to do something awesome. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to to remember why we started sinking. So then next time when you're in one of these really supernatural, beautiful moments where you're being used for my glory in life, you can remember I have to fight to fix and keep my eyes on Jesus through the whole thing no matter what comes my way. In other words, the next time you go through a situation like this where there's a storm, you're going to be stronger for it because you're going to remember, oh, that doubting didn't get me where I wanted it to. So Jesus, he's not mad at him in this moment. He's simply going, no, let's talk this through so that you can start again smarter next time. So I'll I'll land the plane with this. Uh, I was a couple years ago sitting in my office and I was uh, supposed to be working on a message. And instead I did, again, don't get judgmental. I know some of y'all do this too. I started scrolling. (laughs) <laughs> and I got into a wormhole on YouTube, and I was just looking at, I mean, conspiracy theories. I was all over the place. It was, it was nuts. I should have been working. And I got to uh, one scroll, and it said, uh, commencement speech at USC by Will Ferrell. And the minute I saw Will Ferrell and commencement speech, I felt obliged that I had to watch it. And it was 25 minutes long. He did what you'd expect. For the first 20 minutes, he just made everyone laugh, talked about his college experience, was hilarious. And then the last five minutes... He did what they hired him to do, which was to inspire them as they commence out into the adult world. And he gave this analogy, and he just started talking about all the times he failed before anyone knew who Will Ferrell was. He just said, I failed as a stand-up comic. I was struggling to get good at sketch comedy, which he would ultimately be known as one of the greatest ever eventually. He goes, I would try out for commercials and I would get denied all the time. I tried out for these really small uh, movie parts and I would get denied all the time. He said, before anyone knew my name, it was failure after failure after failure. He said this, and I love the metaphor. He said, but you know what I did? And he said, here's what I want you to do, students. He goes, I just kept throwing darts at the dartboard. He goes, and most of them didn't even hit the dartboard. Most of them, it's like when you throw the dart and it hits the drywall and dad's got to come patch it and he's grumpy, right? We know how that works. He goes, but every now and then you'd hit one. And it wasn't close to the bullseye. He goes, but statistics and math just tell you if you throw enough darts at the dartboard, eventually you might even hit a bullseye just because you keep trying. You keep throwing darts at the dartboard. And I thought it was so cool that I brought my wife in because this was 2021 in the darkest season. And, and, I, and I was doing so many things that weren't what, what I wanted to be doing. But I could honestly look at God and say, you know, I'm trying so hard right now, God, in this season. So I called my wife in because she's my confidant, my best friend. And I said, watch this video with me. And I showed her particularly the last part. And I don't know if she understood the gravity of it for me in the moment. I didn't think she did. But I'm like, this is like, who thought God would use Will Ferrell to speak courage into my life, to speak energy into my life? But he did. Just keep throwing darts at the dartboard. And we got done. And my wife gave me a very underwhelming, oh, yeah, that's great. Cool. I'm going to go back to... (laughs) I'm going to go back to being an adult. Are we good here? You should maybe work on your sermon, bro. Right? Right? Didn't think of it again. Fast forward. 
Two weeks later, two weeks later, I get a doorbell ring. My office is right by the door. Now, the kids are at school, so here's the rule, and we all know this now. In, in 2024, here's the rule. When the doorbell rings at 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, we all know who it is. It's Amazon. <laughs> Husbands, trigger warning. I'm about to trigger you, right? Like, it's, it's Amazon. And me and my wife have a don't ask, don't tell policy when it comes to Amazon <laughs> because I don't think I've literally ordered one thing in my life from Amazon, but we get packages somehow every day. And I'm like, every time the doorbell rings, I'm triggered, right? Because I'm like, how many more jobs do I have to get to support my wife's Amazon habit? Like, and so I've just learned, like, I love my marriage, so I don't even, I don't even go there. I just pick up the packages robotically. I go put them on our island and I go back to my office and I pray for my wife and it's over. (laughs) Hey, next month relationship series, just a quick plug, but you're not going to want to miss it. It is going to be awesome. Well, one day I, I, get, I get the package and I notice it has my name on it and I'm confused because I'm like, I, I didn't order anything. I've, I've never ordered anything. And so I open it up and it's this big picture frame. And you can go ahead because this, this sits in my office to this day. I stare at it every morning in my prayer time and I will keep it up in my office till the day that I breathe my last. This is a, a, a picture of the patent for the dartboard from 1935. And with that dartboard picture, my wife gave me a note, and it basically, I'll cliff note it for you, but it basically said, Chad, I am so, as your wife, I am so proud of you. In the hardest year we've had together personally and as a family, that you wake up every day and you just keep throwing darts at the dartboard. She said, Chad, I see how hard right now you are trying. But more importantly, she said, God sees how hard right now you are trying. And he, and I want you to hear this at every campus. Men at God behind bars, Rams unit, please hear, hear, don't hear me. Who cares about me? Hear the voice of God today for you, for this year, for whatever you might be going through this year, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You, you serve a God who just says, I love you for trying. Trying does matter in the kingdom of God. It's not just success. And you're not just being ranked by your failures. You're being ranked by the motivation of your heart to get up every day and say, God, I want to make a difference for your kingdom. I want to make a difference for your glory and for your name. And there's going to be some walking on water moments. Those are fun, aren't they? And there's going to be some wind and wave moments where you, with the good intentions, you just get your eyes off Jesus. But here's the cool thing. Lord, help me. And it says what? Jesus. Immediately, he helps him up. And then they go into teaching mode, learning mode. That's that. Why wouldn't? uh, This is one of the thousand reasons I love serving Jesus is I have permission to try things. And when they work. I don't get cocky because I know it's from the grace. You don't walk on water unless Jesus is supernaturally helping you. So when things are succeeding in Chad's life, you don't get cocky. You stay humble and you stay grateful. But here's what's equally beautiful. When things aren't working and it looks like the world's calling what you're doing is a failure, you don't get condemned. There is no condemnation, uh, church, for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been set free from the law of sin and death. You have been freed up to just keep trying. That is the heart of God for you. And so my ending challenge today, as we wrap this thing up, is that some of you at every one of our campuses, you're in a walking on water season right now. And can I just say, here's how, here's how we're supposed to handle that as a church. We're, we're told in the book of James, we're supposed to celebrate with you. If you're in one of those seasons right now, and everything is just going the way it's supposed to go. God is blessing things. There's a favor on your life. Things are moving and shaking. The, everything's going to the up and to the right. Listen to me. I celebrate that with you. Enjoy it. Every one of you who's going through that right now, don't look over your shoulder waiting for the wind and the waves. Life will do that no matter what. You just enjoy it right now. Use some of that blessing from God to serve and to help other people. But we just celebrate with you. But there's a bunch of people at all of our campuses right now, and you feeling compelled to get out of the boat, but you're scared. And if that's you, I just want to say, I'm getting out of a really big boat right now. (laughs) When I found out I was voted to be the candidate for this job, right? That's a big 
boat to get out of. You understand that? And I'm so excited. And I am so scared. And guess what? That's okay. It's great that you can do both those at the same time. But my only prayer through this whole season has been, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. If it's not, tell them all to vote no. <laughs> I mean that. I mean that. I've been, God, you know, you, you, River Point deserves something amazing right now. My family. Yeah, y'all been through it a little bit. You deserve something amazing. My family also could use something amazing right now. So I got to say, I am scared to death. I am excited. All of, all of the fills and everything in between. I'm like, every hour I feel different about everything. And that's okay, right? You steward through that. But one thing I know is, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. And there's going to be some supernatural beauty in it. And there are going to be some wind and there's going to be some waves. Anytime God's in something, there's storms that come with it. Y'all understand that, right? But there is also supernatural walking on water and we learn and we try together. So I'm going to say this one more time and then I'm going to pray. Would you, in fact, as I say this at every campus, would you just close your eyes? Because I don't want you to see me. Who cares about me? I want you to, I want you to hear the voice of God for you in 2024. I don't care if you're 12 years old in here or if you're 88 in here. We're all children in the kingdom of God. So son, daughter, I love you for trying. Sincerely, Jesus. So may the Lord bless you today. May he keep you in the grip of his grace. May he cause his face to shine upon every single one of us. May he turn his countenance towards you and pay attention to you. And may every single one of us at every campus walk out of the doors with a peace that passes understanding. In the name of Jesus, amen.